I'm Daniel Dazzi. Thanks for joining us. Now, the Bank of Ghana says it will forward its findings on operations of five collapsed banks to the appropriate state authorities for further action. This is in response to several calls for prosecution of shareholders and directors of the banks who have been cited by the central bank for poor corporate governance practices, among others. Three of the five defunct banks were found to have been operated with falsified licenses. The two others unlawfully loaned money to its shareholders and related parties to the tune of 5.3 billion CDs. Deputy, Gov Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Elsie Awaji, spoke with me on the Super Morning Show on Joy, 99.7 FM, this morning. Well, we have said that we will look at what is available to us in our armory, uh, our regulatory armory. Uh, we may have administrative uh, powers to declare persons no longer fit and proper to do business uh, in the banking sector. Uh, we would, to the extent that we have appointed a receiver, we would ensure, we would expect that they would pursue any recovery that they can, they, 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 they can pursue within the court system or any other means that are lawfully allowed. We would also be able to pass on all the findings of our, our investigation so far uh, to the appropriate state agencies that are mandated to to investigate and to prosecute if need if if uh, if warranted so what we know is that there is a lot of um, a lot of wrongdoing on the part of individuals that that contributed to the collapse of these companies and we will not stop at revoking their licenses we would ensure that we pass on to the appropriate quarters what uh, needs to be followed up through, and we will be judgment. You said you are, you are passing on these documents of investigations done so far. When is this handing over being done? Who are you handing them over to? Well, that's still work that's ongoing. Like I said, we've just appointed a receiver yesterday in the person of Mr. Nia Manodoju. We're going to be working with them so that they can pursue all the civil uh, options that are uh, civil law options available to them, going to court and all of that. Uh, they would also take steps to report to the appropriate quarters, guided by, you know, the findings of all the reports we have so far, so that, you know, the appropriate, appropriate agencies take, uh, take up these matters. When we're going to do that? As soon as possible. Matter of minutes, the newly created Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited will officially begin operations having taken over the collapsed banks. All the branches of the five affected will open for business at 1 p.m. Let's go live to my colleague, Ebenezer Sabote, who is on standby at one of these affected bank branches to bring us up to speed on what is happening there. Sabote, where are you and what can you report? Right, Eben Sabote is on the line with us. We want to find out, Eben, where are you and what can you report? Hello, can you tell us? Hello. Hello, Sabote, are you there? Can you tell us? Right. Uh, let's also go to Kumasi. We'll uh, rectify that issue with Eben Sabote now. Prince Apia is at one of the branches in Kumasi and joins us with the latest. Uh, Prince, which bank's branch are you and what's happening there? Yeah, um, Daniel, I'm currently at uh, the Unibank branch at uh, Edum, the main branch at Edum. And I would say that a few minutes ago, uh, we saw a number of uh, customers converging at the entrance and, and a few minutes ago, we saw officials of the bank come to talk to them and if explain to them that at 1 p.m. the bank is going to open for business. So all, all the customers that had stood there had all left um, at the Beach Capital, Beach Bank and Royal Bank as well. And there were a number of people there who had come to um, transact business. And the same thing, security uh, persons there had to speak to them, explain to them that the bank is opening at 1 uh, p.m. And as a result, um, all these customers have left. So if you check these banks, um, as of now, nobody is there in regards to customers. Nobody is there waiting for anything. 
And we expect that at 1 uh, p.m., we will see that some customers will be coming in to see the call, transact with them, ask the bank officials how to explain to them, Daniel. What was the general sentiment among these customers you met? Yeah, um, basically what we, we, we sense was that um, communication didn't go down well with these customers because some of them told us they didn't know anything about the fact that the banks will open at 1 p.m. So some have traveled long distances from wherever they are to the bank to take some money. And you know that some are also trying to buy um, Pita training forms and passport forms, which some of these banks, especially Unibank, is the only a bank that is selling these uh, documents. So, and the deadline is also um, close by. So most of them had come to do that as well, and they were unable to do that. So they were stranded, and they were thinking of what next to do. But most of them, after hearing that 1 p.m. is open, they will come back. But they will, they will come back. Mm. And others, we also spoke to and uh, say that, especially with Unibank, we're saying that they're going to take all their money after the bank is open because of what has happened earlier in the year. And they were given assurance that the bank is going to come back on this. And now they are being told that another um, government is taking over the bank. So some are saying that when the bank right. is and they get in, they are going to take all the money. Right, thank you very much, Prince Apia. He is in Kumasi. Let me come back to Accra. And Eben Sabute is at the Unibank headquarters. Um, Eben, what is the situation currently at the Unibank head office? Okay, Daniel, over here, the situation is calm. Um, I haven't seen any customer here yet, and I tried to engage some of the street guys who they paid, paid an, paid an anonymity. Anon I mean, they were saying that, you know, the information has gone down yesterday that the place will not be open until one. Therefore, most of them didn't come here today. The place here is it's just a normal, you know, but the place is closed as, as, as I speak. The bank is closed as I speak. But you know, if you know the World Trade Center very well, it houses so many institutions. So it's other uh, government institutions or private sector institutions that are going about their market. Right. Has the signage changed at the Unibank headquarters? So it's Unibank. There hasn't been any change. I haven't seen any official attempting or trying to change any corporate image of the bank. It's so Unibank. Right. Thank you very much, Ibn Sabute, for that report. Now, away from that issue, the newly sworn in chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mrs. Jean Menta, has assured Ghanaians that she and her co-commissioners will live up to the expectations uh, the expectations of Ghanaians. Now, speaking at her swearing-in ceremony conducted by President Ekufadu yesterday, Mrs. Mensah observed she and her deputies appreciate the task ahead of them and will do their best to discharge their duties and responsibilities professionally. I, I do in the name of the Almighty God swear. Do in the name of the Almighty God swear. That I will not direct you or indirectly. That I will not direct you or indirectly. Communicate or reveal to any person. Communicate or reveal to any person. Any matter which shall be brought under my consideration. Any matter which shall be brought under my consideration. Or shall come to my knowledge. Or shall come to my knowledge. In the discharge of my official duties. In the discharge of my official duties. Except as may be required. Except as may be required. For the discharge of my official duties. For the discharge of my official duties. Or as may be specially permitted by law. Or as may be specially permitted by law. So help me God. So help me God. The electoral process of any republic public, is a midwife that delivers its democracy. We are therefore aware of the huge responsibility and the weight of expectation that comes with the assumption of these high offices. But we are prepared, and by God's unfailing grace and our own exertions, we will succeed. We acknowledge the good work of our predecessors, and we will strive to build on their achievements. In doing so, we will count on the support and experiences of the staff and the institutional knowledge residing in the Commission. With God being our helper, we'll work with the parliament, the political parties, the judiciary, civil society, and the media 
to build an electoral commission that this nation can depend on to uphold its sovereign will and their right to choose its leaders. Mr. President, we wish to assure all Ghanaians that we will hold ourselves accountable to the laws of the Republic of Ghana. Articles 42 to 49 of the 1992 Constitution and the Electoral Commission Act, Act 451 of 1993, will be our guiding lights and our signposts in this regard. Once again, I thank you, Mr. President, for the honor bestowed on myself and the deputy chairpersons and member of the Electoral Commission. May God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make our nation great and strong. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, President Ekufadu charged the new public servants to discharge their duties in the interest of Ghanaians and not for any political party, not even his government. Our own interest is to have an electoral commission that organizes credible, transparent elections. We do not want electoral victories handed to us by officials of the Electoral Commission. We want electoral victories handed to us by the people of Ghana. You, Madam Chair, and your two deputies have come to office at a time when there's considerable anxiety in the nation about the work of the Commission. It is the quality of your work that can reassure the Ghanaian people that the democratic system of government that they have chosen for their governance will be properly nurtured by an electoral system that allows their voice to be plainly and loudly heard. It is no secret that I have spent much of my adult life fighting for the establishment of democracy and human rights and advocated for a credible electoral process in Ghana. Now away from that, Mrs. Mary Chinri Hesse is now the Chancellor of the University of Ghana. She replaces former UN boss Kofi Annan. She was sworn in yesterday at the University of Ghana Great Hall. Until her new role, she served as the Vice Chairman of the National Development Planning Commission. There's more in the following report. The distinguished national and international public servant is one of the first female alumni of the University of Ghana to be awarded honorary degree of the university. She became the first female deputy director general of the International Labour Organization from 1989 to 2000. She has received several prestigious awards, including the Order of the Star of Ghana in 2006 and the Guzi Peace Prize for International Diplomacy and Humanitarianism in 2010. She is currently the chairperson of the Goodwill Ambassadors of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center after several years as Under Secretary General of the United Nations. President Ekufuado wants the university to continue being a trailblazer in academic excellence on the continent. I assure you of government's steadfast commitment and continued support to the University of Ghana and indeed to all other universities in the country. It is my expectation and hope that Legon will continue to produce graduates who are molded to take on the opportunities and possibilities for higher achievement through innovation and creativity in today's science and technology-led, knowledge-driven global economy, and who will thereby help generate prosperity for the mass of our people in our time. Mrs. Mary Chinri Hersey, who served as special advisor to former President Kufo, says universities must reform their training modules to meet the needs of industry. African nations must need to repair the institutions of higher earning, earning, learning to provide the knowledge required for the essential and desired knowledge economies which will drive our development agenda. Fortuitously, the University of Ghana has already taken several important steps 
to tackle some of the growing challenges. We have a strategic plan for the period 2014 to 2024, aimed at just that. And uh, this, this will make the university shine even brighter. She succeeds former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. To the Ashanti region now, where Nigerians fair past dealers at Swami Magazine have besieged the Swami police station for protection on Wednesday. Uh, the foreigners say their lives are in danger after unknown persons assaulted their members and kicked them out of business. This follows a directive for foreigners to leave the retail market space for Ghanaians, which governments later withdrew. Nanase Sumensa has been following the event. Over 500 Nigerian spare parts dealers at Swami Magazine have to run for protection at the Swami police station. They have closed their shops as a result of persistent death threats. Chief Kizito Ikechiku Obiora is leader of the group. We're supposed to feel threatened. This one is not easy. It's not a matter of feeling threatened. Let's go to magazine now. You will see them. Those boys are there moving around. If you doubt, let's just move now as a, as a media. Let's go there. You will see them. They are there. So, now that we are feeling threatened, now that they are threatening us. We, we, we want the security agencies to come in. Actually, we are pleading with the commander, if he can mobilize his men, to lead us in numbers to go back to our businesses so that we will feel protected. Because honestly, if we go there, those boys will come back again. That is what we are pleading for. One of the Nigerians who was beaten at a shop recounts his ordeal. I finished uh, locking my shop. Let me spark them my motorcycle and go. The guy if you say that, I will not take the motorcycle. He started hitting me. I was respecting him because I'm not a Ghanaian. I don't have to retaliate. All of a sudden, he made a call about a group of boys. The other one was with a plank and a, a table, leg, the, the leg of a table. They were hitting me here and there. From the back, they hit me to, uh, to, to, to the point I, 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 I fell uh, uh, on, on the floor before they started uh, running away. They, they, they thought I'm dead. So Meanwhile, leadership of the Ghana National Association of Garages has registered their displeasure on how the local spare parts dealers are assaulting the Nigerian counterparts. Nana Osaibonsu is chairman what is of the Association of Garages. Hey. Now, government has passed law that these Nigerians do not have the right to retail in Ghana here, or these foreigners. Yes, we support the decision of the government of the day, but our concern is that there are more Ghanaians too doing business in Nigeria, some of them retailing, some of them doing other works like fitting shops and so many works. So, if we do that, we don't deal with these Nigerians with care, we are going to bring a serious problem to the people, to the Ghanaians in Nigeria. So, we do not agree with the purpose dealers who have taken the law into their own hands, attacking the Nigerian people in Magazine here. Because Magazine belongs to Ghana National Association of Garages or the artisans, and not for the spepers. Reporting for Joy News, Nana Hassan Sumensa. Well, we have Nana on the line now because we understand that the leadership of these two groups are meeting the regional police commander today. Nana, what's the latest on this meeting? Hello, hello, Dagi. Um, yeah. The update to this um, particular story is that I'm now the Ashanti Regional Police Command, actually, has summoned both parties to judge all the situation and make sure that there is a long-standing solution to this um, problem. So at the moment here at the Regional Police Command, um, mo both parties are indoors, and I'm sure the whole um, meeting is expected to kick start in as a 10 minutes. But you can see some of the members around, they are all indoors. So um, speaking to some of the um, leadership of the Nigerian State Party, they are saying that um, they are hoping that um, the police intervention will bring forth um, a solution so that they can go back to their business, open their shops, and then 
are start selling their papers. What of the Ghanaians? What was their expectation? Uh, speaking to the Guta, that is the local uh, paper sellers, they are pissed. And then they are telling me that um, it is somehow illegal in, in our laws that um, a foreigner will dominate the retail market. So they are hoping that um, the government directive, which was withheld um, later on, will also be, take effect so that they will take over the retail market and then also get back to the business. Because they are saying that, they are complaining that the Nigerian and other foreigners have taken over the separate dealers, dealing, which is actually a retail market, which shouldn't be so. So this is what is actually a okay. between um, the local separate dealers and the Nigerian separate dealers. Right. Thank you very much, Nana Sensimenta, for that report from Kumasi. Now, General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson Esedu Nketia, officially declaring the campaign for national positions and um, a flag bearership of the party open. He is urging those aspiring to lead the party in the 2020 elections to avoid opulence and be frugal in their spending during the campaign. He's also urging them to avoid the political mudslinging that usually characterizes such campaigns. Mr. Nketiah says individuals can declare their support to candidates, but the party and other wings shall and must remain neutral. Joining us on the phone is my colleague Maxwell Agbagba, who is at the press conference. Um, Maxwell, what else has Mr. Isidro Nketiah been saying? Well, Daniel, um, the general secretary of the NDC, uh, John Nketiah, officially declared that the campaign the national positions and flag bearership of the party have been opened. Uh, it's urging those aspiring to lead the party in the 2020 elections to avoid um, opening and be frugal in their spending during the campaign. Um, he's also urging them to avoid um, all the mass changes uh, that usually characterize you know, such um, um, campaigns. Uh, he said individuals can declare their support for candidates, but the party and other wings shall and must remain neutral. In fact, he spoke to specifically to the issue, uh, the thought that the minority purpose in parliament is actually endorsed and President John Mahama. He downplayed um, that report and he said, and the people who did the endorsement, it came from individuals and not the minority um, as it's in the stadium. He says for people who go contrary to the grand rules that they set uh, for the upcoming national and flag bearership election, uh, sanctions will be applied. Right. Right, thank you, Maxwell, for that report. Still watching Joy News today. A lot more coming up on this bulletin. Stay with us. Still watching Joy News today. Thanks for staying with us. Now, the famous penicillin used extensively to fight bacterial infection was accidentally discovered from a fungus. Rice false smut disease can lay waste several hectares of rice fields as much as 75% loss. But there's a bright side as the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has successfully used the extracts from this stubborn disease to fight infection. On Tech Thursday, Love FM's Chrissy Debra speaks with Judith Anani, a chemistry graduate of the university. The rice false smut disease is caused by the fungus known as Ustilaginodia virens or U virens. The disease, which occurs in more than 40 countries, especially in rice producing countries of Asia, but also in the USA, reduces both grain yield and grain quality. In Ghana, places like Diapompo in the Jusujabin district and Timaso in the Jurassic Dumasi district are affected by the disease. Just like penicillin, penicillin is now used as a, 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 an antibiotic, used worldwide, everywhere, to fight bacterial infection. But as of now, some mic microorganisms are growing resistance to these infections, to these drugs. So I was thinking, you have a stubborn rice disease. If I can get it to work, if I can investigate it and get some activity, antimicrobial, antioxidants or anti-inflammatory activities from it, then we can actually replace this drug that the microorganisms have grown resistance to. We can replace them with these new variants. The final year thesis, supervised by Dr. John Mensah, set out to separate a pure sample of the fungus. 
So for the anti-inflammation work, we realized that the, I used the standard Dexa, Metasone, and Diclofenac as my standard. Those are the drugs in the market right now that are being used to fight anti-inflammation, that are being used to fight inflammation diseases. So I compared my work, I compared my results, my, I used my extract on a chick model to see how it would, the results I also get. If I use Dexa, the, the standard, the Dexa and the Diclo, and I use my extract, which one will be best? From my results, I got good results. My my extract was able to work effectively, like the like the Dexa, like the Diclo that are also in the market. It wasn't very much better than them, but than the standard, but it was comparable. It had I gave me comparable results, so my results were good. It has so in conclusion, my extract has anti-inflammation activity. It was comparable. It had Judith is still carrying out investigation on other properties of the fungus. My extract. Reporter for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. And that was for Tech Thursday, this week's edition of Tech Thursday. I mean, but it's now time for business. Stay with us.